Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Industrial Info's 2021-2022 Global Mining Project Spending Outlook. My name is Peggy Tuck, and I am going to be your moderator for today's webinar. Now, this webinar is proudly sponsored by Hilliard Brake Systems, a world leader in industrial braking technology. Hilliard Braking Systems has a proven track record of performance, reliability, and value to their customers and offers an entire range of electric brakes and other products, disc, uh, disc brakes, caliper brakes, um, other products such as power units, mounting brackets, and also discs and hubs. Now, just to let you know that the data, which will be discussed today, is coming directly from the IIR Metals and Minerals database which is currently tracking almost 30,000 active capital and maintenance projects globally. You may not know this, but mining is one of the few industries that came through the worst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic economic crisis in fairly good financial and also operational shape. And so far this year, thanks to those rising commodity prices, most of the industry is touting a full recovery. So over the next hour, IIR's industry experts will discuss the issues and trends which are impacting the spending in the global mining industry. They're going to break it down by all the mined commodities as well as geographic regions. Our presenters today are Shaheen Chohan, IIR's Vice President of Global Analytics. He, uh, Shaheen has actually been with IIR for a little over 10 years now. He's based in Industrial Info's Dubai office. And although he services um, clients globally as well as in that region, Shaheen has a background in consulting, strategic marketing, and analytics. Also joining is Joe Gogro, IIR's Vice President of Research for the Metals and Minerals Industry. Joe has worked for the company for 35 years. He is a subject matter expert on capital spending trends in the mining, metals, and mineral sectors. He has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Geology from the University of Houston. <clears throat> now, both will be taking your questions following the presentation. If you would like to submit a question, just look over to the side of your screen and you will see an area that says questions for you to put your question in there. Please feel free to do that at any time during the presentation. And then we'd also like to invite you to participate in just a brief survey following today's webinar. So let's get started. Here is Shaheen Chohan, IIR's Vice President of Global Analytics. Good morning, Shaheen. Good morning, and uh, thank you very much, Peggy. Um, as those of you who uh, typically join us for these webinars, I do like to start with a look at what the macroeconomic outlook is at the moment, and I think because I think that really helps put some of the spending and certainly the industry trends that we're going to be discussing today into context. So. Here's the IMF's latest GDP data, which obviously, as we can see here, shows some growth projected this year at about 6%, and this is due to moderate slightly to about 4.4% next year. Now, the projections for both years um, have been revised upwards, and that really reflects a number of factors working very much in concert, namely the raft of fiscal support provided by some of the bigger economies, uh, which is obviously uh, having that very nice positive knock-on effect for smaller economies around the world. And also there is the expected uh, vaccine-powered bump or recovery that's expected certainly into the latter part of this year and early next year. And really that's on top of a number of initiatives and policies that have been put in place uh, really to try and increase mobility and unlock uh, some of that pent-up consumer demand. Now, the short term is still rather uncertain, um, and that's really down to really trying to get the, 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 that, that fine balancing act between opening up economies whilst also managing that expected spike in COVID cases, the new Delta strain. Now, one thing I do want to touch on, and you're going to hear this throughout the, the, the discussion, is that the impact of COVID, whilst starting to wane, wane slightly, the crisis has actually helped build momentum around the energy transition story. COVID's obviously had a major impact on um, energy supply, demand, and in some ways has really opened up the, the possibility or the reality of what a lower carbon outlook could look like. Now, regardless of the size and pace 
of this energy transition. I don't think it'd be unreasonable uh, really to expect some degree of additional economic growth stimulus from that transition as it starts to kick in. Now, obviously to limit 21st century tem temperature rises to that you know, golden 1.5 degrees Celsius is going to require us to get to a carbon neutral world in the next 30 or so years. And this is going to be very complex. It's interrelated uh, and not to mention requires, as we can see here, huge uh, volumes of infrastructure and technology investments going forward. And whilst it's not really just about uh, cutting down uh, on the amount of energy we consume, as well as being more efficient in energy usage, uh, which itself is going to be at all a difficult task simply because of the continued population growth, uh, rapidly expanding you know, middle income Asian uh, demographics, industrialization in the emerging markets, as well as just sustaining uh, demand from those very energy hungry developed countries. But really, uh, the, the, the main theme of this transition is going to be about rebalancing, and it's about rebalancing the composition in the type of energy that we consume, uh, and that will require a major transition. And that transition is going to generate a pull and increased levels of demand, as we can see here, for a number of metals and minerals needed really to make this uh, come to fruition. So turning to metals prices, here is a set of trend lines showing monthly percentage changes for various metals and i've rebased this back to january 2019 just to, just to see how things have proceeded now what we can see has been continuous uh you know pick up in metals prices since the slump uh at, at the peak of that first covid 2020 outbreak now part of the the price increases that we've seen is simply off the imbalance in supply and demand from lower global inventories due to uh, mine shutdowns and reduced productivity, lower volumes of commodity coming to market. Now, met many metals, even pre-COVID, were you know, already nearing a point of supply deficit, uh, you know, such as copper. But supply constraints are now being worked off. Um, but you know, I, you know, and, and Joe will talk a little bit about this in a little bit more detail hasn't really fully caught up with the, the rate of demand growth for commodities and metals that we're seeing. Um, and then I think if we then go and layer on top this new mega trend uh, that is leading, you know, associated with the energy transition, this is now leading some analysts to predict that we may actually now uh, be shortly about to enter into a uh, commodity super cycle. So, Joe, with this sort of dual set of drivers, one associated with the need to invest uh, to meet pent up demand growth and replacing aging and, and falling ore grade resources, and also now this new mega trend of the energy transition, do you actually think this will lead to a new uh, you know, mining boom super cycle? Well, thanks, Shane, and, and really well laid out there, I think, uh, the way you explained that. And I, I think the the, the next uh, mining su or super uh, cycle has already started, uh, but it won't be as dramatic as the last mine spending boom, which really peaked in uh, 2012, as you can see in this graphic, uh, with the uh, leading spending uh, for uh, – six of the majors, um, it's unlikely we'll see spending reach 2012 levels again. Uh, mining firms are being much more conservative in their CapEx plans compared to the last up cycle. So I think it will be much more long-term uh, staggered increase over the next decade or two. In the near term, uh, mining companies are planning to spend more. Uh, these uh, six companies here, uh, are increasing CapEx this year by 16.7%. And except for a blip in uh, 2020 due to COVID, uh, spending has increased every year since the bottom of the market in 2017. Um, these companies have increased CapEx by 45% during this period. Uh, spending will taper off a bit in 2022, but still at elevated levels um, and based on the current demand outlook uh, beyond 20, 
22, I expect spending to continue to increase gradually. Uh, the energy transition will bring sweeping changes, as uh, Shaheen mentioned, uh, not only to the mining industry, but the entire industrial complex, which will not only have to increase capacity, but also have to be retooled to be less carbon intensive. Uh, General Motors has said it will spend $35 billion by 2025 to increase electric, uh, electric vehicle production. Uh, that includes building two new battery manufacturing plants. Most of the major automakers uh, have announced similar plans, and this will drive demand for battery metals. Uh, the industry is actively developing new technologies to achieve this. Um, mining equipment supplier uh, Sandvik uh, says it expects for the market for battery-powered mining equipment to increase significantly over the next two to three years, and that it will likely uh, sell more electric than diesel-driven vehicles within 10 years. Uh, the International Council on Mining and Metals which includes uh, the CEOs of 28 of the world's leading mining companies and 19 OEMs, has developed uh, the Cleaner, Safer Vehicle Initiative, which has a goal of emissions-free mining fleet by 2040. Um, they are collaborating to develop a new generation of mining vehicles and improve existing ones by implementing anti-corrosion technologies to make mining, to make vehicles uh, safer and technologies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the mostly diesel mining fleets above ground and underground. So this is a, a, an important initiative, I think. So Joe, with that as the, the kind of the broader context and backdrop, we're starting to see the mining companies ramp up their capex. What does that now look like in terms of the, the, the volume of projects that you and your team are tracking globally at the moment? Well, the volume's going up a bit, uh, and here you see a global outlook for mining projects. On the left, what's under construction, um, and we've seen an uptick, an uptick in the value of construction activity of about 4.4% this year compared to last. Uh, more proof of the improving market conditions, I think. And then we have about $1 trillion worth of active projects in the planning and engineering stages being developed worldwide. And you can see the Americas leads the way, followed by China, Africa, and Oceania. And here, so we took that, that large number of projects, and then we look, this is what's supposed to kick off. Well, some of this has kicked off this year, and what's supposed to kick off for the rest of the year and uh, through the end of 2022. Um, and you can see that the value of projects by market region here and commodity. Now, we don't expect all of this to begin construction as scheduled. Uh, we've had uh, an average yearly project realization rate of around 29%. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about the uh, project spending index. Okay. Now, uh, Joe, we're going to uh, turn to one of our first market regions and the US and Canada, obviously a major global commodity and mining hub. And, and as we can see here, still presenting a, a fairly substantial pipeline of planned capex. But um, my question to you is with the increasing focus on ESG investments and obviously the, the environmental regulations that are, you know, that are put in place, do challenges still exist for North American miners? Do you possibly see a shift in the metals and minerals value chain, for example, one from, uh, you know, rather than mining commodities, why not just import the raw commodities and, 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 and then process and, and, and use it? Yeah, I think uh, even with the, um, uh, the current uh, demand driver uh, tailwind that the market has, uh, mining projects in the U.S. have been constrained. Uh, especially for new mines due to uh, the burdensome uh, permitting and regulatory requirements and not in my backyard opposition. As a result, companies are looking to expand existing assets, uh, restart closed mines or adding new pits or going underground where, where possible rather than develop grassroots assets, or they're looking offshore. 
Um, national security and the desire to keep supply chains domestic are growing in importance. Um, there's a lot of discussion on whether we should encourage domestic mining or rely on other countries for supply of critical minerals. It, it appears to me that both will be needed to accommodate the expected demand growth. Uh, the U.S. government has uh, actively funded research, development, and commercial enterprises engaging in critical mineral development, including rare earths and lithium, and also is actively actively developing supply chain partnership with allied countries such as Australia. Uh, this heat, heat map uh, is taken from our Geo Ex Explorer mapping and analytics tool, which is available to all subscribers uh, of our global market intelligence. It allows greater functionality and will eventually be replacing uh, the older tool. Uh, this shows uh, 398 medium and high probability projects totaling 39 billion in the U.S. and Canada uh, through the end of 2022. The chart on the right shows these projects by commodity, and you can see that uh, gold projects lead the way, followed by potash, oil sands, and copper. Uh, Rio Tinto Kennecott, uh, uh, just as an example, will be expanding an exist existing open pit and going underground at its copper mine in Utah. Uh, the company will spend more than $2 billion over the next 10 years to accomplish this. Um, in Canada, there are a couple of large oil sands capital projects. We expect to begin construction during this time period. Uh, that industry is down overall uh, due to the oil price, but there are a few uh, projects uh, for new technology being installed in the existing mines there. And most of the activity in oil sands right now is in, in maintenance uh, shutdown work. Uh, Canada has banned new uh, or expanding thermal coal mines and is scrutinizing new um, metallurgical coal mines. Um, Canada is the world's largest potash producer. Uh, BHP Group is expected to make a decision in the next month or so on the Janssen potash project where they've uh, already spent $4.5 billion sinking two mining shafts, and they have another $5.7 billion uh, to finish that project off if approved. Okay. So, Joe, um, if we could now head south, Latin America, obviously, as we can see here, the, the, the third biggest mining region based on planned spending. Do you see uh, regional miners facing the same sorts of uh, headwinds as their Northern Hemisphere counterparts, bearing in mind, obviously, the, the, the proportional contribution, the big contribution that mining and commodities makes to uh, regional GDP. Yeah, it's a, it's a little different dynamic in, in Latin America. Uh, we're seeing a lot of supply and production disruptions and project delays, both a pandemic and social related. Um, in countries like Peru and Chile. And uh, yes, the pandemic continues to hamper project development with lockdowns in many places in Latin America and around the world for that matter in uh, the Asia Pacific region, um, Australia and uh, the Philippines, for example. So we're definitely not out of the water when it comes to uh, COVID. Um, Anglo Gold, uh, Ashanti and B2 Gold have recently delayed a feasibility study on a $925 billion gold project in Colombia, and they cited pandemic as one of the main reasons for that. Uh, there's regional geopolitical issues that are constraining project development, especially in Chile and Peru. Uh, Peru has a newly elected government, and they recently brought in a, a, a new mining minister, uh, and they plan to uh, look at the mining companies company by company for new taxation uh, to ensure social profitability to the local communities as well as provide incentives to mining firms who comply. Um, Chile is evaluating royalty increases, which could have an adverse impact on miners in that country. Uh, we saw Freeport Mac Moran has said it would defer making an investment decision for a, a large uh, copper sulfide project at El Abra in Chile. 
Um, and there's a lot of social unrest. Uh, we've seen union strikes and blockades at some mines, which is constraining production and is partially responsible for the spike in copper prices this year. A uh, possible strike um, at the world's largest copper mine is imminent. Uh, Escondida, which is owned by BHP and Rio Tinto, could happen uh, any day, um, and that would add volatility to the situation. Uh, Kodoko, which is the world's largest uh, copper miner, continues to increase production and has offset some of, uh, of the supply disruptions. And we have a number of smaller and, and uh, medium and high uh, probability projects uh, in Latin America, but the mix is uh, very different than North America um, and is dominated by copper and then iron ore, uh, gold, silver projects, and uh, lithium. And for those of you interested, we're going to do a uh, Latin America market outlook uh, tomorrow, actually, in uh, Spanish. And so we're, we're hosting that uh, tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, Joe, obviously, in terms of regions, uh, we really can't have a mining discussion. Uh, it wouldn't be complete without uh, taking a look at what's happening in Australia. Um, what spending levels are we expecting to see there? Is, 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 is the market in good shape from a project perspective? Yeah, I think uh, we're tracking about $23 billion worth of medium and high probability projects in Oceania. Um, Australia is a leading exporter of iron ore and coal. Uh, iron ore is mined mainly in Western Australia and coal in uh, Queensland and New South Wales. Uh, most of the iron ore miners are expanding. Australia has uh, also has substantial copper, nickel, lithium, uh, mineral sands, and rare earth projects underway. Uh, BHP has said it's going to build uh, new nickel mines and wind farms in Western Australia, and it's uh, uh, signed a recent supply agreement with Tesla. And we're seeing this as a growing trend where automakers like Tesla and General Motors are investing directly in mining projects or signing uh, supply agreements uh, for battery metals. Um, New S South Wales is showing increased activity uh, recently, uh, and this is due to several large projects for coal, iron ore, and a large nickel project. And um, we're also going to uh, host a uh, Oceania uh, webinar, a metals and minerals webinar on August uh, 25th, if anybody's interested in more details on on this market. That's great. Thanks, Joe. Now, we're going to sh uh, shift gear a little and now focus on some specific uh, mined commodities. I'm going to start with coal. Now, um, the obviously, the majority of coal consumption is coming from the power, power generation. And whilst we continue to see, obviously, phenomenal pressure on coal right now, uh, especially with the phasing out of coal fleets, certainly in developed markets, we are in fact uh, still seeing new, new coal-fired capacity being developed in, in many parts of the world, mainly in Asia. Um, there's around 315 or so new grassroots coal-fired power plants, uh, and that's associated with about 1,700 or so new coal-fired units uh, that's on top of the, the 8,100 or so um, still operational coal-fired units out there. So what we can see is there's still um, a phenomenal installed base for coal consumption. And, and what we can see here uh, is just some power, uh, coal, uh, some power project spending based on our five-year uh, industrial spending forecast. So either way we look at it, there is pressure on coal, but still a very much a huge addressable market consuming coal out there right now. So with Joe, um, back to you, with that as the, the kind of the backdrop, a kind of a, a, a two-pronged or a two-sided story for coal, really, are we still actually starting to see some of that um, translate into additional mined coal spending? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a large market, and, and with the improved economy and increased uh, electricity demand, thermal coal usage is increasing. 
at least in the near term, and probably through uh, 2022. Coal continues to lose market share to other fuel types for power generation and is being phased out in many European countries and in North America. Coal remains an important source of project activity, even with uh, this uh, global decarbonization uh, movement. Um, Asian countries, uh, mainly China, India, Japan, Indonesia, and Vietnam, continue to build coal-fired power plants. Uh, and coal still accounts for 57% of China's power production. Um, in the in the Europe, uh, the EU wants to phase out coal by 2030, but uh, Poland, which relies on coal for up to 80% of electricity needs, said it cannot phase out coal that quickly. And you can see here on the map uh, quite a significant spending in that area. Uh, metallurgical coal, which makes up about 14% of the global coal production and is used mainly in steel production, is increasing in demand. Uh, due to shortages and the rising prices, China has said it will increase coal production by 110 million tons by restarting mines and approving projects. As a result, we continue to see large capital expenditures, mainly for capacity or mine replacement projects and uh, smart mining automation projects, uh, especially in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, the short-term trend will see coal usage increase in some Asian countries, probably peaking by the end of the decade, and then f uh, followed by decline after that. Uh, China has banned Australian coal, but uh, most producers were able to find new markets. Uh, this ban is also benefiting other coal exporting nations, including the U.S. and South Africa. Thanks, Joe. Um, now turning to iron ore, obviously, as China's economy, um, which came back online, I guess, much earlier than many other nations, and, and also with China being the world's biggest consumer, uh, miners, um, you know, for much of the year have, I guess, somewhat struggled to keep supply up, certainly to meet that Chinese consumption growth. Should we expect to see this? Will we see some good, healthy pricing for, for uh, iron ore, um, and also, is that going to translate into high levels of spending? Absolutely. Yeah, demand from steel manufacturers has been robust, not only in China, but now North America and Europe. Uh, China's iron ore imports hit a record high last year, jumping 9.5%. They uh, imported 1.17 billion tons of iron ore uh, last year. And iron ore prices have recovered significantly this year, nearing historic highs. Uh, supply disruptions from important producers such as Vale and Rio Tinto continue to boost prices amid strong demand. Uh, vale is slowly ramping up capacity after the 2019 dam disaster and has been focused on $2 billion worth of water filtration and tailings projects at mines in Brazil and uh, is planning a major expansion at the Serra Sul mine in Brazil. Rio Tinto and other iron ore producers are expanding capabilities in Australia, and there are significant expenditures planned in other parts of the world, um, such as Chinese investment in uh, Simendu in Africa. Uh, China said it will build two iron ore mines overseas by 2025. Thanks, Joe. Now, uh, turning to copper, obviously, um, one of the bellwethers for, for uh, economic growth and a, and a good indicator. Uh, and it also sits as one of the, the, you know, the big five metals in terms of uh, the energy transition. It, it was already entering, to some degree, a state of supply deficit even before COVID. So are we, again, starting to see copper miners respond? Are they, are they increasing their uh, levels of investment over the short to midterm. Yes, uh, yeah. With the global economic recovery uh, and the infrastructure boost from China and supply disrupt disruptions in Chile and Peru, uh, this continues to keep copper prices elevated. Um, the price of copper reached historic highs just a few months ago, before dropping uh, over the past few months. Um, 
and as one of the key metals needed for new decarbonization technologies, as well as the infrastructure required to supply electricity, copper demand will show growth uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, Chile, Mexico, and Peru, uh, Peru account for 43% of the global copper ore production, uh, according to the USGS, um, and we're tracking over 18 billion uh, in projects in Chile just for Cadelco. Uh, the, they're the world's largest copper producer. Uh, the interesting thing about that is um, for their long-term spending plans, um, this expenditure will only maintain or slightly increase production through the life of those mines going out 20, 30 years. And this is mainly due to declining ore grades and to depletion of existing operations. Um, and all of Cadelco's projects are brownfield additions or expansions of existing mines, which leads one to think, where are the new, where's the new capacity for all of this growth coming, going to come from? Um, in Mexico, uh, Grupo Mexico plans nine billion investment through 2027, uh, mainly at its Sonora mining operations in Mexico. That includes a 500 kilometer power transmission line along the Baja Peninsula, uh, a s expansion of a smelter and a grassroot uh, copper mine project uh, named El Arco. And you can see from the heat map uh, that Peru and Chile region is the largest for copper projects which 100, with 143. Uh, North America and Australia are also big markets for copper mining. Africa also has a good number of projects um, as the world's largest consumer of metals, China is actively looking to invest in overseas projects, and Africa is a, a prime target for them. Uh, Chinese uh, owned China Molybdenum just approved a $2.4 billion expansion of its Tinky uh, Fugurume copper cobalt mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thanks, Joe. Now, Joe, uh, turning to a, a couple of precious metals, obviously um, they tend to have a slightly different uh, or contrary price trend, uh, certainly when there's an economic downturn where we see uh, certainly the price of gold spike. But obviously uh, both metals have um, a big industrial consumption base as well. Um, what are the current trends that we're seeing? Are we seeing uh, increased spending or are we seeing it flattening out? Yeah, gold and precious metals are always uh, big spenders, it seems like. And with coming off of a historic high gold price uh, recently last year, uh, the price has dropped a bit. Currently, is around $1,700 per ounce. Um, but it's still up 70% from the bottom of the market prices at the end of uh, 2016. So uh, gold project development has been brisk. And you can see from the map that Africa leads the way with uh, Southeast Asia and Americas as busy project regions. Thanks, Joe. Now we're, we're going to come to our, actually our final commodity in one of the uh, the big five energy transition metals. And you know, there's all, already uh, consistent and strong demand for lithium from you know, usage in you know, mobile phones, tablets, uh, laptops, but clearly now the new growth momentum is going to be coming from electric vehicles uh, and that, you know, that market continues to grow. And so some analysts are predicting, uh, you know, 70% of all mined lithium could eventually go to electric vehicles by as soon as 2025. Is this, Joe, this sort of projection or forecast, is this actually leading to, again, an increase in mined investment? Absolutely. We're seeing increased activity from exploration projects uh, through to feasibility and, and, and onward for lithium. And until recent months, uh, lithium prices had been on a downtrend. Uh, prices for lithium surged over the 2016-2017 period, but additional capacity expansions outstripped demand growth between 2018 and 2019. And this triggered a slump in prices. 
uh, the COVID pandemic added further bearish pressure to lithium prices in last year, and the result has been some capacity idling and planned expansions deferred until the market returns. And that seems to have happened now with price, prices surging recently on increased demand. Um, and lithium project development is, is growing. So there's 111 lithium mining and processing projects under development, totaling 18 billion. Uh, Rio Tinto has committed $2 billion to develop its JADAR lithium project in Serbia. Uh, they're gonna produce uh, lithium carbonate. Um, in what uh, just a few years ago was a sector controlled by a handful of producers is now a battleground for development as companies scramble to meet expected growth. Um, demand for lithium is expected to grow, I've heard anywhere from five to 50 times, depending on uh, which analyst you listen to uh, over the next 30 years. But uh, regardless, it's gonna be a, a large growth and require a lot of new capacity. Um, SQM and Albemarle are the two largest lithium producers. Um, SQM has said it's going ahead with plans to more than double capacity and has approved an expansion as part of a $1.3 billion investment plan through 2024. Uh, there's also quite a bit of uh, mergers and acquisition activity in this space. Um, China is involved uh, Ganfeng International, which is a Chinese firm, has made deals to acquire uh, Baccarona Lithium and plans to begin construction soon on, on the Sonora Lithium project in Mexico. And they've acquired other, other smaller lithium uh, companies. So uh, that actually, Joe, almost brings us to, I guess, the formal conclusion of, of the presentation, certainly before we head into the question is an answer. So maybe, Joe, you could just spend uh, time on your own just talking talking us through and summing up some of the spending trends. And this slide is across the entire metals and minerals industry that you're tracking. And then obviously give us your conclusions. Yeah, so I think it's interesting to look at the project spending index. This is a global spending index for the entire um, metals and minerals industry. And it provides a 30,000 foot view of the entire industry, which not in, includes not only um, mining, but also steel, cement, smelters, foundries, and so on. Um, so if you look at this, um, it takes, what it does, it takes the initial pool of projects, which are the tan bars or the bars on the left, light blue bars, sorry. And that uh, we had, that's what we had at the beginning of those years, scheduled to begin construction during that year. And then the green bars are what actually began construction, or the dark blue bars, <laughs> what began construction uh, during that year. And then the uh, project realization rate is the, uh, the red tri uh, triangles, uh, which uh, was at a low of 25% in 2017, and now has increased up to 30% uh, this year. And this shows the forecast for 2021 and 2022 based on a, an average realization rate, rate of 29%. So based on, if you look at the most recent update of the Global Project Spending Index, which is available to uh, customers on PECWeb, uh, construction activity for metals and minerals was up 28.4% uh, this year when compared to last Looking forward to 2021 and 2022, uh, we've already had $95 billion worth of projects begin construction this year. Uh, so applying that uh, realization, 29% realization rate, uh, brings to the final number of around uh, $191.7 uh, billion. So this is subject to change based uh, uh, on market factors. So it could increase or decrease by plus or minus 5%. And uh, just uh, summing up uh, in conclusion, um, you know, we continue to see economic and market drivers improve. Construction activity is increasing. Mining firms are spending more money. Um, the en energy transition is adding to this uh, and is driving a lot of projects. 
Um, the challenge will be in uh, how to make uh, the industry greener and take a concerted effort from uh, um, not only the industry, but governments and organizations like the International Council of Mining and Metals to take the lead in those areas. Constraints continue from geo uh, geopolitical issues to uh, permitting and regulatory uh, issues, and uh, that's going to continue to shape the industry uh, through 2022. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to, um, to Peggy. And thank you so much. That was some really great information. Thank you, Shohan, as well as Joe. Um, terrific presentation. And we do have some questions coming in from the audience. And I'm going to start with Ryan. Ryan says he's interested in providing escapeway elevators for underground mine shafts. What would be the best way to target those potential needs? Well, I would say the best way would be to identify the underground mines, and um, we can definitely help uh, him do that. Um, and then I would get in contact with the, uh, the key decision makers at those mines, which we can help with as well. Okay. Um, Troy would like to know, it was stated earlier that CapEx spending is not expected to increase uh, to 2012 levels, but won't automation and electrification trends cause a spike in that spending? Do I have? Yes, yeah, so I think I think so. Um, mm -hmm. I guess Joe. Also, I mean, uh, one parallel that we could we could see is that. Um, that we've seen in, you know, for example, shale plays, uh, where you can actually produce more with less, uh, you know, production efficiencies, you know, advancements in technologies. Are we seeing a lot of that kind of investment uh, that's probably not requiring as much of that grassroots development? Would that be fair or is that slightly off mark? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the, a lot of new technology automation um, coming in to um, make mines more efficient. That's the main, one of the main drivers of spending is productivity opt optimization. So uh, companies are, are spending more on, on uh, automation uh, equipment and, uh, and, and uh, systems to allow them to be more efficient. We have a question coming in from Frick. It says, with copper prices near record highs, are more projects moving from possible to probable as expected or other factors like South America's uncertainty permitting holding projects back? Yeah, I think uh, you always have, if you always have to balance the, uh, the, the high, prices and and you know focus on where you think the demand is going to be in the long term for these especially when you're spending uh, millions and billions of dollars on on expanding assets so uh, the mining companies have to take all of that into consideration and and uh, you know we've seen seen that played out uh, with with copper and uh, I, I think it's a really good question, certainly for copper, because I think the, the, the demand growth for copper, um, you know, it was already high, uh, you know, simply off the, the you know, the, the, the volume of wind turbines, for example, that are already being deployed and, and constructed. So that kind of energy, energy transition has already been going on, and that's had a, a really big pull. All the battery storage solutions, electric vehicles, all of that's going to has been really adding to what was already reasonably solid copper demand. Um, I just don't know how we're going to meet it if 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 we don't get this balance between, you know, mining environmentally better potentially. I don't. I really don't know what that means. But um, you know, at some stage we have to we have to explore uh, explore and and uh, and you know raise production levels, and that 
and that's going to require more investment in copper mines whether as Joe alluded to earlier it's about going deeper uh, so taking above ground underground or just going deeper and ex you know doing those mine expansions of existing copper mines then at some stage we are going to have to meet that otherwise we're going to be in, in quite a critical supply shortage I think uh, in the not too distant future. Okay, Joe, Stephen says, so the thermal market in the United States will continue to, to, to decline, correct? Are there any new thermal mines in the U.S. which are being built or at least have permits for right now? Uh, yeah, the, the thermal market is actually increasing this year because of the increase in um, uh, demand after the, from the COVID rebound. Um, or the lockdown rebound, but um, long term, yes, the, the trend is uh, a less market share for for thermal coal. Um, mm -hmm. There are some small mines being developed that we're tracking. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the projects um, are. You know, and those are mainly in in the U.S. and in the Appalachian region. There's one in Colorado as well, and of course in Canada, that's been been slowed uh, considerably since they're looking at. Uh, they said they're not going to develop any new any new mines. So, yeah, I, I think the the market for for grassroot is very small in the U.S the thermal. Okay, James says, you mentioned that Metcoal is being highly scrutinized in Canada. Should we expect the same thing in the U.S. in the near future? Um, it's possible. Uh, you know, so far there hasn't been any um, the, the, the Biden administration has balked on, on agreeing with at the last summit meeting on agreeing to phase out coal uh, mm -hmm. so there's no uh, government uh, uh, I would say uh, direction to do that at this point all right we have a question coming in from Matthew it said can you further describe the type of automation that the mining companies are inventing um, to drive productivity and efficiency? Well, I think the autonomous vehicles is one thing uh, where they're um, for safety and for efficiency uh, and it also reduces your, your labor costs and a lot of these mines are, are uh, automating uh, you know, they have a control center where they're uh, controlling Autom uh, automated vehicles underground. Um, so this is um, definitely driving driving spending and up, uh, the productivity optimization part of it. Joe, what about uranium? Where, what role does that play? Well, hopefully we'll see, uh, you know, some development of new new. Uh, uh, nuclear reactors. I know uh, there's some talk about building small modular reactors, which will not have as large of a demand as as some of the larger, you know, the larger, uh, older technology. But um, I think long term it could play a role if uh, you know if we get it needs government backing to to develop nuclear. I definitely think it's a clean fuel that can be um, operated safely if, if um, you know, right uh, under the right direction. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of back that statement up, Joe. I think when you look at what we have to achieve in what is relatively a small amount of time to really get to that decarbonized uh, or zero net zero carbon environment, then you know surely nuclear will have to play some role or some part in helping support that i mean it's 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 green uh, or greener it's, it's pretty efficient obviously these nuclear plants are a slow burn 
kind of projects. But um, I possibly think that, yeah, there could be some support from new nuclear capacity in certain parts of the world that could, could certainly add some uh, demand support to uranium development going forward. Right, especially if you want to phase out fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah. Um, Daniel would like to know, he said, looking again at capital spending going forward, um, do you see any meaningful differences in the areas of capital spending in the mines in open projects today versus looking back, say, 2011 through 2013? Yeah, I think uh, in that, in the in the 2011, 2013, during the peak of the boom, the companies were more interested in increasing capacity, new projects. And I think that the trend now is more on productivity optimization and uh, more measured growth um, rather than uh, spending a lot of money uh, um, but it's it's I definitely think it's kind of the long term trend. We'll see a, an increase uh, in in project spending going forward. Yeah, yeah and I, th I think we've seen uh, a number of years of retrenchment, really, um, you know, since that 2012 peak. So a, a degree of retrenchment from you know committing large, these big mega projects. They take 10 years to go from permitting through to uh, production. Uh, rife with environmental issues and all that kind of good stuff, um, you know. And over, and I think over that course of time, we've seen, you know, the many majors become more discerning about where they allocate their their, their, their spending, and the, the focus has been really on we've have an asset, it's producing, so let's go deeper or wider uh, to some degree, and it's a lot easier to do that probably than than commit new grassroots development. But I, I, I and obviously whilst doing that also increase the productivity per ton or efficiency per ton by, as Joe said, adding more automation, more technology, more solutions into those operational mines. But I still think that, you know, we we talked about it a little earlier about this potential mining commodity super cycle. I think, you know, if we're really going to, going to commit to this energy transition, we need those commodities. And so we're going to have to see that CapEx come through. The mining companies, as Joe showed, are in much better shape. They've got healthy balance sheets um, yeah. and they're, they're, they're focusing on really strategic plays now. And as we know, there are five key key metals in that. They call them the big five. It's the, you know, the aluminum, it's the, you know, copper, it's lithium, it's cobalt, etc. So I think that's possibly where all of the the, the focus could end up. And, and and markets like coal maybe see less investment going forward. So it could just be a kind of a, an investment, a, a portfolio shift for many mining companies in terms of where they allocate their investments. Um, we have a follow-up question on uranium, and Joe would like to know if IIR is tracking any uranium projects specifically in Canada. Yes, yeah, there's, um, Kamiko is developing a few projects, um, and, and Canada and U.S., um, and there's other, other companies developing. There's, the projects are there. It's a matter of the market, uh, increasing so that some of those projects can go forward. We've been tracking some of these projects for 30 years that, they just continually get pushed out and out and out. Um, so the projects are there. It's just a matter of, you know, that market uh, coming up to drive those. Um, Joe, what about taking a look at Africa? Um, what's the focus when you look at um, short-term to mid midterm spending on that? Africa is a big market for for mining projects and and investment from from foreign countries like China and India. Um, I, I had several examples that that we talked about uh, for iron ore, bauxite, uh, copper, platinum's big, big uh, in South Africa. Um, 
so there's there's quite a bit of activity uh, and growing growing activity in Africa. Yeah, and and I think one of those big motivators, and Joe, Joe touched on it a little earlier about foreign direct investments. A lot of that's coming from China. China sees uh, Africa as part of its Belt and Road Initiative. Um, really to elongate and build those mega supply chains, so from mine through back to uh, you know, uh, factories and manufacturing plants back in China. So it's really about securing that, and, and Africa is very much a, a target for Chinese investment at the moment. Um, Joe, we all know about lithium and the role that's going to play, especially in, as the electric vehicle and the push for that moves forward, but are there other metals um, that are or minerals that are gonna gonna benefit and help with that push yeah and the battery battery metals uh, w would include lithium cobalt nickel uh, copper uh, there's aluminum in batteries there's uh, a mag uh, man manganese and and other metals but um, there's a a slew of metals that will be required uh, to to develop electric batteries. And then finally, and they're all, they're all um, growth. And and of course, coal is always you know it's it's the the bad kid in the room and has been for so many years. But when it really comes down to it, um, there's a certain amount of that, that that's needed for this whole new push as well. Yeah, well, the U.S. still relies on about a third, 27% of its uh, electricity comes from coal. You can't get rid of coal, and we'd be in a power outage if we got rid of coal. Um, so until we can figure out how to ramp up other sources, uh, coal is going to be around. And it's growing, as we said, in, in the Asia-Pacific region and probably will be for the next at least 10 years before it starts turning around but um, you know there's a lot a lot that needs to be done before we can get rid of coal okay that pretty much wraps up our questions today and I want to say great questions from everyone thank you so much um, Joe Shaheen thank you so much great presentation and great insight do want to remind everybody that all of that data that was discussed um, over the last hour can all it, it, it came directly from Industrial Info's Metals and Minerals database. And if you would like more information on these types of products, just contact your sales rep or go to industrialinfo.com, and someone will be more than happy to get you the information on that. Um, we'd also like to invite you to take part in just a very brief survey following the webinar uh, close. And again, thank you very much to our sponsor, Hilliard Brake Systems, a world leader in industrial braking technology. And if you want some inf uh, more information on the products and services they have, you can um, email sales at Hilliard Brake Systems.com. If you would like to reach out to Joe or Shaheen, as you can see, their contact information was right there on the screen. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you go out and have a great day. Thanks, Peggy. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy.